back again, episode 10, Chalk Talk, here with Rob and Edward, as always, in today's episode, we're going to talk about dealing with injuries and how to, uh, that, how to uh, do that, how to do that, yeah, first, yes. disclaimer, we are not healthcare <laughs> providers or clinical professionals, so, PhD cocks, we can't give advice on dealing with pain, however, we are powerlifting coaches and you've been working with powerlifters for any degree of time, you know that most powerlifters are in pain somewhere. All and, the time. And if, we, if every time someone had a little thing that bothered them, they probably would never train for the rest of their lives because because powerlifting is, is suffering and, and that. But, but it's fun. But and there's underwater basket weaving, which is a great sport, and you could do that and yeah. no pain. Yeah. Exactly. You could knit a blanket, you know, walk your grandma's dog with her. So we know our audience, and we know <laughs> we like to train, and there there will always be some degree of, of pain. However, we're not we're not dealing with the pain. We're we're developing strategies to to make the most out of our training and to get the most performance for the squat bench press and deadlift. You just wrap some shit around it and you train. Throw your sleeves on. You get an ice pack, and you. <laughs> and then you wrap some stuff around the thera gun, and then you use that wall you lift mm-hmm. during. So, so, so in dealing with injuries, working around injuries or like managing your training so that you can get meaningful, meaningful training in without letting the injury affect what you, your training, the variables, the most effective variables that we're going to be dealing with are adjusting your range of motion, adjusting the volume that you're using, so sets times reps times weight, and then in, adjusting the intensity of training you're using, so adjusting how much weight is on the bar or how much, or in other words, how much load is going through that tissue. And if we can define these thresholds, so say when you when you squat below parallel, you feel this, this pinch in your hip or, or like your, your low back starts to bother you, but if you go to if you squat to a, a half squat height or even a quarter squat height and it feels fine, yes. If you're <coughs> injured, you could totally do that. But you just say half squat. Yeah. Only if you're injured, but if, Get him out of here. <laughs> if you're using the injury as an excuse for you being a friggin' wiener, then and that's a whole it's different hey, episode. Wiener. <laughs> Weenie. Or, or another way to think about it is if, say, you have three sets of 10 at 60%, but, like, by the fifth rep of every set, your knee starts to, like, really start to ache and you, you, it's really concerning to you, then maybe five reps per set is the volume threshold in that acute time frame. So if you did, instead of uh, three sets of 10, you did 10 sets of three. So you stay below that rep, that volume threshold, but you can still get the total amount of work in without your knee bothering you, yeah. you're getting good work in below that threshold. Mm. Or say you're doing, again, three sets of 10 at 60%, but like from the first rep, you're like, oh, my knee is really angry and, and it's, it's like it's trying to tell me to not do this. But when I was warming up and I, I did my last warm up at 55% for a set of 10, everything felt pretty good. Maybe the, the, the intensity threshold for where I'm currently at is around 60%. So if you scale back 5, 10% from that threshold, get a bunch of work in there where your knee isn't bothering you anywhere near as much as at 60%, that's a good way to get trained. And so look, like from a very global perspective, that those are the variables that we're dealing with in managing training around injuries. Now we have some some real world examples in in Rob and Cox's training. So Rob, would you like to tell the audience what, what you were dealing with in the last yeah, couple months. Tell him while I out. He's, uh, he's wrong. Uh, I never get injured. Uh, <laughs> on to the next place. <laughs> I'm a steel trap. <laughs> I have no emotion. <laughs> I don't get injured. Uh, I had an appendicitis. And they took my appendix out. And it sucked. What? How selfish. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what a takeaway from training and my sport and everything. You made your weight, though. Weight I, class? Yeah, I like, to, I like to think that I was dropping weight before the appendicitis. And <laughs> it wasn't just what caused me to lose weight. Um, so I had appendicitis. I had it taken out. No big deal. Uh, and then, surprisingly enough, I quit training and I don't lift anymore. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> yeah. That's how you deal with it. That's how you deal with it. You never come back to whatever gym you are currently don't at. Don't touch weight. Yeah. That is wrong. All of that is wrong. Don't listen to that. Had appendicitis. Got surgery. They got to uh, take it out. So I just got to scale back my training for that amount of time. I didn't train for two or three days right after the surgery. 
Um, and then I came back and I just started really light and kind of worked my way up more of like a, like a ramp up phase into it. And if you don't know, if you have an appendicitis, they cut into your like abdominal and they take it out. So, um, that was kind of what I was working with. So doing uh, things that were like a lot of pressure, uh, I just really couldn't do. So I came back, started with a little bit of like light assault bike stuff, just moving around, um, walking upright and stuff like that just trying to build more strength back in my core because you know that's what they cut open so i just dosed it really low and then kind of added on day by day and that was kind of the the right thing to do and it was like training dosage and the weight i had to make sure i wasn't like pushing a bunch of weight or trying to do any of that or so you weren't doing 200 pound weighted planks i wasn't i was just doing body weight yeah. uh high plank holds because i didn't want to get crazy too into the plank real like right off the start so high plank holds are a little bit less. So I just did some of those, um, some like weighted carries with, with maybe like 20 pounds, 30 pounds. You weren't back squatting 30 pounds either? I, I did not back squat. Did you, did you do some kind of squat? Did you like air squat? I did some body weight squats, some goblet squats, like 10 sets of 10 of them, just to brace and have to move around my own body weight. And I just tried to build strength back with that. So I didn't just stop training after surgery. I came back uh, probably three or four days after surgery started moving around a little and then I just ramped it up from there and you know two and a half weeks or yeah two and a half weeks of training or three weeks of training and I had a okay. rugby game so I had to play and so I came back to playing and I'm totally fine now it's all gone I still got my little scars but uh it was just about dosing the training right if I had to come back and dose it a little too high or something like that then I'd just be re-injured and out for another four to six weeks and then down that rabbit hole of constantly chasing injuries so it sounded like you as you were saying, you, you gradually ramped up the volume and the intensity over time. You didn't just hit yourself and like the volume you were doing pre-surgery. I missed um, a few days. Got to get back to five by ten. So, <laughs> so you did that pretty well. But in that in that time frame, there must have been like some cases where you took a range of motion, like you went through a range of motion that that sort of tweaked your your abdominal area. Never happened. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> it totally happened. Crap! You didn't film it. It didn't happen. I didn't film it on purpose. <laughs> Or I filmed it and I did not post it. <laughs> and you didn't tell a soul. And I didn't tell anyone because I was the only one in the room. <laughs> uh, yes, I did. So I was doing like a dumbbell press. And I was bracing my core, doing dumbbell press. And I got lazy with one of the reps. And when I pressed, I went a little too far back. And it kind of like stretched out. And uh, I didn't like hear it pop or anything. Like that. I just like stretched out. And I was like, oh, that hurt. And I set them down. And I was kind of like, okay, my, my core hurts a little bit now. I, that's probably the range of motion I shouldn't be doing right now. So that was probably, or that was the range of motion that I just couldn't, couldn't do right then. And it, whether it be like I got lazy with the brace and I let it come back a little, which kind of stretched me out, or just, you know, just I should stay away from overhead press for maybe another few days. And as long as we can define those, those range of motion thresholds in, in like safe ways. So say you're doing a, a dumbbell overhead press, but you're doing it like lighter, you're nowhere near pressing near no one rep max, yeah. right? Then you going a little too far back doesn't, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna feel uncomfortable in the moment, but it's nowhere near as risky as if you had 225 and an overhead press, or like a yeah, military press or a red press, yeah. and press at a red, and you got behind you and it's like, oh shit, this is a lot of weight. Yeah, and I, sh I should touch on that. That happened and I didn't just stop training that day and go home and say, okay, I'm not ready for training now. I gotta wait another week or two. That happened and I was like, okay, that is one of the motions I cannot do right now. Let's move on and do shoulder side and front races where I'm just standing straight up. I didn't just scrap it for the day. It was like, okay, that's something, that range of motion I can't handle right now, let's adjust. Yeah. And like there, there, it requires a certain degree of humility to, to know that like, I'm injured, I'm gonna have to scale back my training and not sort of just poke into what hurts by doing the training that I've been used to. So <laughs> say, say you're doing three sets of 10 at 315 in the back squat, and then like one week your knees started bothering you. Instead of, you gauging how much pain is in your knee in three 15 pound three by 10 back squats maybe you start with like sets of 10 at 225 and if if it feels good there you go up to like 245 and if it feels good there go up to 275 and, and on and on until you get to like oh, i get to 295 and it, it, it starts to bother me a little bit maybe i could scale back to 285 and that's a good number instead of you know the only time i train a squat pattern i only go to 315 that's it. If it if it never feels good at 315, I'm never squatting again. And I've I've seen a lot of people only have that approach where it's like you're telling me to squat 225. There's so many people in the gym who've seen me squat 315. If they see me squat 225, they're gonna think I'm a wiener. 
And and that's, that's and that's the reality of like people come to the gym and they power lift because they want to like build their confidence and et cetera, et cetera. But like when we're injured, we like what we're capable of when we're injured is significantly different than what we're capable of when we're 100% healthy. I can't tell you how cool you feel doing 10 pound side raises and front raises and cruising on an assault bike at some really low speed. And every one of your friends' gyms like, oh, maxing out today, huh? Like, come on, Switch man. Switch to CrossFit, huh? Yeah. God, dude. <laughs> Just get over it, man. Goodness. And it takes a certain degree of, of trust that that is the most meaningful thing you can do to return to training as possible. So, like Rob said, it's like you're not going to just quit training altogether. You're not going to just take your bag and go home and throw a temper tantrum. But you're going to come into the gym and you're going to st- define what those thresholds are where you can train, where, where, where you start to experience symptoms that negatively affect your training. And then you go just underneath that. Let me, Abe, I should probably touch on something with that. It wasn't that comfortable to come back and train. Like, oh, absolutely. I was uncomfortable. My, my abs and stuff still hurt. <laughs> Lack of abs. Yeah, a keg, bro. Way better than a keg. Yeah, an ab. An ab, one ab. (laughs) An ab. Anyways, I should really touch on that for everybody out there. Like, it wasn't comfortable to be back training. It was uncomfortable walking around and lifting some weights up and doing the bike and stuff. But it was like, it was a doable uncomfort. It wasn't like, I'm making this worse. I'm really injured. I can't be here. It was like, this is a little uncomfortable, but I I need to be able to do something so I can start this rehab process. So... If you're just gonna sit it out at home in like in like the back cave until like everything feels 110 percent comfortable, good luck, man. Yeah, just just don't even get out of bed if you want to feel 100 percent comfortable. Yeah. And defining these thresholds is going to be uncomfortable because it's like, oh, you're telling me to go to that point where I feel that discomfort that is a little concerning. And then scale it back. Yeah, and then scale it back. It's like we can the way we can think of it is we can take a bottoms up approach and only stay in cupcake land and only do 10 pound goblet squats for sets of three. And that's it. Okay, so we're talking about until, until you feel comfortable, or we're gonna find like, oh, you, you feel the discomfort at 315. Let's scale it back to 295. You can work there. That's how we can get you back to training as quickly as possible. And again, it takes a certain level of humility. It takes a certain level of expertise on the coach's side, and it, and it takes just like discipline on on the injured athlete's side to trust that I'm gonna come in and I'm, I'm not at 100, percent but this is what it's going to take to get me back to 100%, if not better. Absolutely. So we want to touch on the other one? <sighs> touch on spinal. Touch yeah. on me, spinal. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll just I'll touch on it really quickly, too. Rob mentioned his injury. Um, I, myself, right now, have an injury. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people in the sports field, lifting field, um, have it had to be everyone I coach has an injury. I'm 110%. I'm good. <laughs> this guy's uh, just... <laughs> I'm over here. I'm in a downward spiral. So, um, so essentially, I'm sure most of you have heard of the injury: herniated disc, crushed disc, blown out disc, what it, crushed spinal. jelly donut, spinal, <laughs> blown out disc. It's like on the wall behind you. <laughs> the blue disc out <laughs> today. Um, it is. I crushed a disc in between two vertebrae. Um, it's leaking a little bit of fluid. It's pinching a nerve a little bit. So I have a lot of people think sciatica. It's a pinched nerve in my back, and I have a crushed disc, so it makes lifting heavy very, very uncomfortable. Um, But with the help of Edward, my coach, and a bunch of other people who I'm lucky enough to know, a couple doctors from down south, um, I'm in really good hands. We've got a uh, big rehab program for myself, taking things day by day. But just like Rob and Edward both touched on, it's very uncomfortable every day. Getting in my truck is hard. Getting out of my truck is hard. Walking sometimes sucks. I have to limp a a few steps before it lets me stand all the way up. Just because you have problems and you know pain here and there doesn't mean you can't work out. I have not skipped a day in the gym. Um, my doctors yelled at me, my mom's yelled at me, my girlfriend's yelled at me. I have a process and we're taking it very, very slowly and working on something and working through a little bit of you know discomfort is better than sitting around and being sedentary. I don't care what the injury is. You might have to take some time off for certain big things. You have surgery and you got a cast on and you can't walk. That's different. You can do upper body still. <laughs> hey, you don't think I'm doing chest four days a week? <laughs> Get about it. Um, you can still do things to move the process along. And I'm, I'm working, you know, sometimes five pounds jump every week is too much for me at this point. Sometimes my range of motion is a little bit worse than it was the day before. 
I get sore, you know, I get the muscle soreness from working out, but I also get nerve soreness and like different body soreness from what's going on. And it's just something you have to take day by day. You have to take care of yourself even more than you would if you were healthy all the time. You really have to take the time out of your day to, you know, do some extra stretching, make sure you're getting enough water and food in. Um, I keep a daily log of like how my body feels morning, afternoon and night and, you know, different positions I'm in that hurt a little bit more one day or don't hurt the next day. Um, and it's a slow process, but it doesn't mean you can't do anything. Like, I'm still in here. I still squat twice a week, still deadlift twice a week. There's just certain methods, certain rep schemes, certain thresholds that we put in place. And I'm working, building back up. I'm, I'm not even at 50% right now, and that's okay. And, yeah, the ego thing takes a big hit. Do I want to lift heavy? Absolutely. Do I, do I look like a, a wiener in here squatting 135? Uh, absolutely. But it's all part of the process and you need to be patient with it. And I think the mental aspect of being hurt is just as important as pushing yourself physically through the little bit of discomfort, being strong mentally and knowing that you're in a process and it's going to take time and you just stick strong to that is, is the hardest part, in my, my honest opinion. So, I mean, just everybody take that with a grain of salt. We're not saying come back in here and like back squat your max because you have more out this. We're just saying like his training is – the training dose is, is very much adjusted for his injury and what he's doing, and he's still able to come in and train. And I'm, I'm working through discomfort, not pain. There's a difference between pain and sharp pain and how this hurts or working through, you know, this is a little tender, this is a little sore, I'm starting to feel it. They're two different aspects, and you need to kind of differentiate a little bit of discomfort from this hurts because you can hurt yourself if you push too hard, and you need to know when to back off and when to push a little bit. Want to touch on that with anything just re, like concluding thoughts reiterate about like uh volume training volume oh my gosh we're gonna need to edit out like the next couple seconds because i no you just think away man it's okay we'll I, just keep talking no, about the I, space i had the thought 10 seconds ago and then it, i oh, lost it it's, it's gone. gone yeah but it is gone Cox, you were talking about something very salient Pain versus discomfort. Yes. There it is. Boom. Oh. Here it comes. Let me go. All right. Shoot out of a can. Go. And I lost it again. Oh, oh God. What is going what on here? Weird. Come on, <laughs> man. The people ah, are waiting. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 It's back. It's go. back. So uh, another way we can think of what is pain versus what is discomfort is it's like if the discomfort you're feeling is affecting your technique, or affecting the range of motion you go through. So, so say you're actively avoiding loading your right hip as you're going through a squat pattern. We can we can classify that as like unproductive discomfort. Whereas if your your right hip is really bothering you, but you're still able to go through the same technique, you just have to go a little slower to to go through the same range of motion. Then it's discomfort, but you can work with it. And, and when when we notice that the discomfort or the pain, whatever we want to call it, starts to adversely affect our technique, that's when we we can start to to down downgrade the range of motion or the volume or the intensity. Okay, that was worth the wait. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that was pretty good. Yeah, that was pretty good. And and what a person rates as like what is manageable, it will vary from person to person. So say you have someone who played so many years of rugby and they're they're like a quote unquote tougher person, they could probably like train around a seven or eight or nine more than someone who's worked a desk job their entire life. And, and, and again, it's like establishing the idea that it's okay to work and, and train when we're not at a zero out of 10. So if there's a one, if we're at a one or we're at a four or we're at a six, whatever we can work with and still get meaningful work in, we want to work there. And that is the vehicle for us returning to training uh, at 100% health, if that is even a, a realistic objective or realistic goal. I think that's another good conversation for a different podcast is what is 100% and when do you know if you're ready or not? Mm, I like that. That's a big one. And a lot of people come back way too early. Yeah. I don't want to cut this off now because we're just going to... We're going to get into it, Ramble. And I think, I think uh, way, like a way we can conclude this episode is I interned under uh, Dr. Quinn Hennick, a clinical athlete. And he posts a lot of really good information on his social media, on his Instagram, and, uh, and on Clinical Athletes Instagram. And what I've been doing is I've been reposting some of his some of his posts every single week. 
and the reason I do that is because my my athletes who are going through some sort of a rehab process, they are continually continuously telling me that that is part of what helps get them through the rehab process because like the way we're describing it, it seems like, oh, just find some thresholds and like work underneath them and it's gonna go up and you're gonna get better over time. And it's, oh, it's this very smooth process. But realistically, it's like some days you're gonna find that threshold, work under it, you're gonna feel so confident. And then you come the next day and you're way underneath that threshold and you're like, oh, I've, I've made no progress. I've actually regressed. I think I'm just damaging my body. I'm getting worse, I'm gonna be, I won't be able to like pick up a laundry basket or play with my kids when I get older. And I'm like powerlifting, I, maybe this isn't the sport for me. And then other, other days, like after that, you come back in and you're like, you know, everything's feeling good. I feel better. I feel stronger than before because I did so much hypertrophy work. And now it's like, oh, I am ready for training. And then you, you go for like a max lift and then your your back gives out again. And you're like, oh shit, I'm back to where I started, if not worse. Like all this work was for nothing. So it's not this smooth process. It's this roller coaster where your emotion and your self-worth and your and your and how you identify, what you identify as, being tied to powerlifting, being a powerlifter, is tied to how healthy you are and how well you're able to come in and execute your training. So Quinn, his post, forces you to take a step back and be like, okay, in the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm looking on social media and scrolling through these, these uh, rehab specialist posts because I'm fucking freaking out. My body is, is really in pain. But Quinn is telling me to take a step back and notice the upward trends in my training. So even though right now I'm doing three sets of 10 and 25 pound kettlebell goblet squats and this is really bothering me it's still 15 pounds more than I was doing last week with 10 pounds and I was only doing five reps per set so I'm, I'm having this upward trend of returning to training and right now it because I'm in so much pain or like I've had this this episode where like the pain has gotten worse it feels like I've, I've regressed so much but if I can take a step back look at the numbers sets reps weight and how I'm gradually increasing that threshold that's how I can trust or like have more trust that this this process is working. I'm, I'm going to get back to where I was before, and I'm going to I'm going to get better. Cool, you like that? Take us away. Take us away. That's it for today's episode, episode ten of Chalk Talk. Once again, you can find us all here at the gym in Katadi, and you can find me Coxmas underscore Coxmas underscore on Instagram. Rob, uh, the Great White Rhino. You can find me here. You can find me on Instagram. And there's somewhere else, other places. Edward? You can find me on Instagram at JR Alecton, and you can find the stuff I write at PrometheusPowerlifting.com, and you can watch my uh, training footage on Instagram too. Booyah! Thanks, guys. We're out.